The following BLTV program is brought to you by O'Flaherty Law. Please enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eric Satterholm. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Congratulations on, to everybody today. I uh, had an opportunity back in uh, November to talk also to a large group um, from an uh, organization called DuPage Pads, and uh, it's a beautiful organization that helped the homeless. And I was struck by their motto, their theme, and it just simply, they just simply said, when somebody believes in you, everything changes. And I really thought about that, and I said, man, that's really true. And I began to reflect and, 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 and look at the people in my life that believed in me, that helped me on my road to success. And I gotta start with my dad. Beautiful, I was very blessed with a beautiful family. Mom and dad were just great, great people. I'll never forget as a kid, about seven years old, my dad threw me his glove. Now back in the 50s, you have to understand that gloves didn't even have laces connecting the fingers or web or anything. It was like if you, if you saw old pictures, the glove just had like five fingers like this, right? So there was a lot of gap between. So my dad throws me the glove. He says, here, let's try baseball. You, I bet you'd be good at baseball. And I said, okay, so I put the glove on and he hits me this pop up and, and I go after it like this. And, Go like that, boom, and it goes right through the fingers that I thought I had. It goes right there, it hits me in the top of the head. And I go, oh, God. He says, don't worry, you're, you're, you, you got this. Just learn to use two hands, you know what I mean? It was good advice from dad. And here's a man who worked night shifts every night of his life so that he could be with his family. He never missed one of my Little League games. And to have that kind of support was magnificent. I had a beautiful mom that encouraged us to do things together as a family. And before my dad and mom passed, they both said to me, son, always remember, it's about the love of family. And I remembered that, and I take that with me to this day. It's beautiful when you have a family that loves each other unconditionally. That's what my mom used to say. Look, we can agree to disagree, but we're gonna love each other unconditionally. So it's important. And I know not all of us are blessed like I was to have a beautiful mom and dad family kind of environment. It doesn't mean that you can't start one when it's your time. You can change that pattern. If things aren't going well in that department, you can be the one that empowers everybody to make those changes that are necessary to experience love. I remember my baseball coach, his name was Red Berry. The football coach actually came to me and says, I want you to play football. And I was going to. And then the baseball coach says, man, Eric, I really believe in you. I've seen you play. I really think that you got a chance to have a career as a professional baseball player. I don't recommend that you play football. You get hurt, and there goes that opportunity in baseball. And he says, I'm gonna push you. I'm gonna push you hard to be the best that you can be. And there was many days when I was cursing at him underneath my skin, voice, yelling at him because he wouldn't let us drink any water. He kept running us and running, but he pushed us and pushed us. And I learned that that's a big part of being successful, having that drive to be successful. I then got drafted by the Minnesota Twins. In 1968, I was their number one draft choice. And my first year in a, as a pro, I had a coach named Ralph Rowe who believed in me also. And I'll never forget, we, were in the, we made the playoffs, and I hit a two-run homer to win the game for us. And we celebrated with the champagne in the locker room, went in the championship, and it was all great. But the thing that was very impactful in my life was the manager's name was Ralph Rowe. He came up to me after the celebration had died down and he put his arm around me and said, Eric, listen, I watched you play all year. 
I think you have a solid chance to be a Major League Baseball player. And when you're a 20-year-old kid and somebody that you respect says that to you, a light bulb goes off in your head and go, God, wouldn't that be great if I could be a Major League Baseball player? Well, the next thing he said to me was the thing that really planted a deep seed. He said, you know, I watched all year. I really think that you're going to be probably around a 270 hitter in the big leagues and hit a lot of home runs. And again, the light bulb went off in my head. Wouldn't that be great if that was, became true? Well, I'm here to tell you that I played nine years in the major leagues, four years in the minor leagues, 13 years as a professional, and take a wild guess what my lifetime batting average was, 271 if you count minor leagues and major leagues. How many home runs they hit? Over 150 home runs. That seed that was planted in my mind as a 20 year old, he believed in me. And I got to thinking about that, how powerful thoughts are. Thoughts are everything. And the sooner that you become aware in your life that there's not a God up here that's going, man, I really like the Eric Soder home, so I'm going to make his life fabulous. But I don't like Laura, so I'm going to make her life suck. You, I mean, the sooner you understand that that's not the case, and the, and the sooner that you realize that you are the one that is creating your reality. To give you an example of that, I remember walking into the major leagues my first day. Major League locker room. And there's Harmon Killebrew, Rod Carew, Tony Oliva, these great Hall of Fame players. And I remember walking in and my thoughts were, God, do I put my pants on the same way that these guys do? I was scared. I was nervous. Could I compete at this level was the thing that kept going through my mind. I would call that doubt. And if we're going to try to create from our fears and our doubts, we're going to have a big problem in life. So the sooner that you can learn to let go of these insecurities and doubts and fears in your life, I guarantee you the more joy you're going to have in your life for sure. I had an opportunity, as I said, to play with Rod Carew. Rod Carew, you probably won't remember now because we're all kind of old, <laughs> but he won seven American League batting championship titles. And I remember one particular game, we're playing the Baltimore Orioles, and I hit four rockets. I hit a line drive at Doug DeSantis on the Orioles at third base, and he took his glove off and shook his hand. I hit a line drive up the middle that Mark Belanger, the shortstop, dove and caught and threw me out at first base. And then I hit two balls that I thought were home runs that were caught. One of them, the guy jumped over the fence, caught it, and the other one was caught at the warning track. And I'm 0 for 4. The same night, Rod Carew went five for five. But the interesting thing about this was that not one of the balls left the infield. He drag bunted twice down the third base line. He hit two weak ground balls up the middle that Mark Belanger caught, but Rod was very fast and beat them both out. And the last one, honest to God, he swings. It hits home plate, bounces straight up in the air. Pitcher's waiting for it to come down. He catches it, boom, throws the first one. Safe. Guy got five hits. And now one ball left the infield, and I got, I'm got i 0 for 4 with four rockets. I'm thinking there's no justice in this game. I'm sitting in the sauna after the game, and Rod Carew walks in. And I said, Rod, I said, it's amazing. I've never seen anybody get base hits like you. It rains base hits when you're up there. He said, Eric, you want to know the difference between me and you? I said, I'd love to. He says, can you look me in the eye and tell me that you're a 300 hitter in the big leagues? I said, uh, no, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, I'm a rookie. I, I'm just learning and getting my feet wet here. He said, that's why, my friend, the base hits fall in for me and they don't for you. Because let me tell you something. I don't believe I'm a 300 hitter either. I know I'm a 300 hitter. There's a little bit more 
confidence there with the knowing versus the belief. So that was very powerful for me. That was like somebody giving me a right hook, a punch to the face, a wake-up call. And then I saw in the paper shortly after that that Rod Carew used a hypnotist to help him with his confidence and some pain that he was having in his legs. And I said, well, if Rod Carew can use a hypnotist, I certainly can also. I'm going to give it a try. So I called the hypnotist. His name was Harvey Mysell. And I went over there not knowing what to experience or expect. And he was telling me what I'm going to feel like. And yeah, my eyes kind of felt like they were glued shut. But I could hear the phone ringing in the lobby. And I could hear people talking. And so I, you know, what is this? This is, this is nuts. So after he brings me out of the hypnosis, he says, all right, well, I implanted some really powerful stuff that you're going to be aggressive and you're going to attack the ball and the ball's going to look like a grapefruit. And I said, okay, good. Let's see how it goes. I go out there that night and <laughs> I struck out three times. The ball, the ball was coming in. It was like at my head level and I'm going, <laughs> I'm swinging at everything that's coming across the plate. Strike out three times, I figured this guy wrecked my career. I said, man, Oshevitz, uh, I'm gonna call him. I called him and he said, yeah, I watched the game last night. And he said, I made a bad mistake. I said, what was that? He says, I just assumed that you knew the strike zone. <laughs> and I said, man, I just felt so aggressive and stuff. He said, so it, come back in. So I go back in. And this time I was more receptive to being hypnotized and I let myself go deeper. And then the things that he was telling me, I was let them, letting them take hold inside. All those positive things he was saying, really, really grasping that and understanding it. And my batting average just kept going up and up and up and up. And pretty soon I'm sitting in New York, we're playing the Yankees, and I look in the paper and Eric Soderholm's in the top 15 hitters in the major leagues. And you know what my thought was? Am I that good? And you know what happened after that thought? Average started coming down again. Because I was comfortable in that range that I told you about. That 270 range was where I felt comfortable. I tell you that story because I want you all, all you young adults, to play it outside your comfort zone. Challenge yourself to do things that are outside your comfort zone. I had a chance to leave Minnesota shortly after that. Free agency came into existence in 1976 with Kurt Flood's case. I couldn't wait to get out of Minnesota even though there was a lot of Swedes up there and with a name like Soderholm or Soderholm you would you would think that it would have been great up there. And it was, the problem was the owner of the Minnesota Twins, Calvin Griffith, was extremely tight with his money. I made 14,000 my first year and deserved to make it because I hit 188. My second year though, making 14,000, I hit 276. So I went in, this is before agents and people representing you, I went in and I talked to Mr. Griffith. I said, you know, this is my third year in the big leagues now. I'm thinking about a $10,000 raise, 25,000 right in that range there. And honest to God, you'd have thought I shot him. He reaches in the drawer, pulls out a piece of paper and goes, look at here, you popped up with the bases loaded on April 12th. Well, look at here, you made an error on, on June 2nd, cost us the game. Hit into a double play here. I mean, he had a list of about 12 to 15 reasons why I should be making the minimum salary again, three years in the big leagues. So you can tell that, that I was kind of happy to kind of get out and see if there was other opportunities around, which I'm sure many of you will experience in your life, checking out the opportunities that you have in life. So I came to the White Sox and Bill Veck, I don't know if many of you remember him, but he was the owner of the White Sox and he had a wooden leg and he had emphysema. He had a bad back, he had all kinds of problems. But when I signed with him, I said to Roland Heeman, who was the vice president, I said, I'd really like to meet Bill Beck. Well, he's in Illinois Masonic Hospital. I don't know if, you know, let me call him. 
Hey, Bill, we just signed Eric Sauter home. Would you like to meet him? Sure. So I go over to the hospital, and there's this guy. I, you can imagine opening up a door, and you see this guy. Looks like a pirate. His chest, his gown is open. His wooden leg plopped up on a pillow. And I'm going, wow, that's kind of a strange sight, I'm thinking to myself. <laughs> and the first thought that came to my mind was not saying, hello, how are you? I'm thinking, no wonder he's got emphysema. If, if you've got a wooden leg that has an ashtray built in it, you got a problem. <laughs> you got a big problem. But he said to me, he said, Eric, we're so glad to sign you. We need a solid utility player who can play several positions. You're going to be of value to our team. I said, Mr. Beck, I've worked very, very hard coming back from a bad knee operation, what you saw in the video there. I'm going to be more than a utility player for you. I'm going to be your everyday third baseman and have a great year. And he said, you know what? If you do that, you come back and see me at the end of the year. I'll take good care of you. See, I thought he took good care of me already. I went from making 25,000 with the Twins after five years to now 50,000, 55,000 actually, with the White Sox coming off a bad knee. So he believed in me. And I went out that year and hit 280 with 25 homers and won the Comeback Player of the Year award. And when I came in at the last game of the season, there was a note in my locker, come see me, Bill Beck. I went up there and there was a contract two-year contract waiting for me for $300,000. He remembered what he said in that hospital about, I'm gonna take care of you. That's a guy that believes in you. Another guy that I ran into in my lifetime. So we were on, I was on the Southside Hitman team, a very famous team. We were like 100 to one before the season started. Nobody thought we even had a chance. We had a bunch of Richie Ziss came from Pittsburgh, and Ralph Gar came from Atlanta, and we had a bunch, uh, I had bad knees. I mean, it was like the bad news bears were put together there. But somehow we gelled, and there was a chemistry. And with this chemistry, we won like 92 games. We had a five-game lead in August with one month to go in the season, and nobody could believe it. It was just one of those magical years where 30, 40, 50,000 people were coming to the park every night watching us hit home runs. We set a record that year for the most home runs hit by one team in the history of baseball. Very exciting. Very, very exciting time in my life. We didn't end up winning that year. Kansas City went 30 and 5, or 25, 26 and 5, the last 31 games of the season. We went 16 and 15, and they passed us like we were standing still. But still, the excitement of that year was, even to this day, I go to golf outings, and most of them now when I go to, they go, when did you play? <laughs> yeah, which is okay, it's very humbling. You gotta, be, you gotta learn to be humble in life. <laughs> but but it, was, uh, it, it was quite different. The, the thing, though, in that year that did more for me in my career was I wrote a poem, crazy enough, about that team, Southside Hitmen. And in the poem, I'm gonna do it for you right now, this did more for my career than any home run I could have ever hit, any play I could have ever made. In the poem, Bob Lemon is the manager of the White Sox, Richie Zisk is the famous player, Joe Rudy is the outfielder uh, for uh, California, and Nolan Ryan, you, some of you may remember that name, was a very famous pitcher. So I wrote this poem, and it, it's called A Warm Day in August. It goes like this. It was a warm day in August when history was made. The people in the box seats were hunting for shade. The bases were loaded, and it was the last inning. And from the sound of the crowd, you knew we weren't winning. Then out of the dugout came Richie Zisk, and everyone knew the ball would be kissed. Legend here tells of Casey at the bat, but today it was the Pollock who tipped his hat. Then cursing and swearing came from the stands when Richie was waved back by Bob Lemon's hand. Astonishing look came over Ziss's face when Lemon said, Sauter Holmes taking your place. As Eric stepped from the dugout came a scream from the fans, you can't hit Sauter Holmes, the big Pollock's our man. Never before in history had they pinch it for Zisk, especially with a bad need free agent who was a big risk. This has to be a mockery, a dirty, rotten shame to pinch it for a man who's sure Hall of Fame. 
Eric heard not a word as he strolled to the plate, but he noticed the crowd's eyes, and they were full of hate. God help me this one time kept going through my mind. If I ever get a hit, please let it be this time. Nolan Ryan looked in and thought, oh, this should be a cinch to throw three strikes by this rider of the bench. Strike one was the call from the man in blue. And four pitches later, it was now three and two. Now everything wrote on the very next pitch. Would Eric stay a poor man and would he suddenly be rich? Then the crack of the bat and a long drive to right. And the back of Joe Rudy's uniform was the only thing in sight. And the roar from the crowd was a deafening scream. Oh, then Eric fell out of bed. It was only a dream. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, obviously with the poem and the year I had, I got bit by the fame game. And that's easy. That pedestal's a tough place to be, folks. That fame is tough because um, the next year, 78, I got caught going on these kind of events, speaking, speaking, three, four nights a week, going out, signing autographs, totally unfocused now. Before, I was so focused on coming back from knee surgery. That's what it takes to be successful, folks passion and focus. I lost the focus. I'm now out, gained 15 pounds over the winter, didn't hit a ball, didn't do anything, and now all of a sudden I'm two weeks before spring training and going, oh no, I gotta hurry up and get ready for spring training. I go down to spring training and the second day I'm there I get shin splints on both legs. And if you've ever had shin splints, you don't want them. They're painful. I missed a good part of spring training, not being able to play. I maybe got in 20-some at-bats the whole spring. I wasn't ready to start the season. But because of the great year I had the year before, they gave me the job. So I'm a third of the way into the season, and I'm hitting 204 with four homers. The year before, I hit 280 with 25 homers. So things are, are not going very well at all. And I remember a very significant game. We're playing against the Boston Red Sox. And I come up with the bases loaded, two outs, and we're losing by one. And I remember walking to the plate. Maybe this will be, if I can just get a hit here, maybe this will be the time that will break it open for me and I'll get out of this hell that I'm in right now, this bad slump I'm in. <clears throat> well, I got into the batter's box and I had an anxiety attack where fear just overwhelmed me. I was in the batter's box literally shaking like this, wondering, God, can people see this? I'm like, I'm like out of my body almost just shaking in fear Strike one, Ron Luciano, the umpire, says. I said, Ron, that ball was inside. No, Eric, it was on the, on the corner. <sighs> Strike two, Ron, that was outside. No, it hit the corner. <sighs> Belt high fastball. I took it, didn't swing. Strike three, I struck out with the bases loaded and didn't swing the bat. You know what it's like to have about 20,000 people booing you at the same time. Not fun, folks. Not fun. I went into the locker room, and the reporters are there, sticking the mics in front of me. What's the matter with you, man? You're hitting like 200, four homers. You're not, you didn't even swing the bat with the bases loaded. I said, get away from me. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm so upset. I normally shower and eat at the park. I, didn't, I just threw my clothes off my uniform off, put my clothes on, and I snuck out the back, got home. My wife had gone to bed, very depressed. I was hungry. I opened up the refrigerator. There was this piece of salami, about this big. Grabbed it, opened up the drawer, out with a knife with a blade this long. I got my hand on this salami and the thought crosses my mind, wow, maybe I could just slice my finger, not off, 
but slice my finger to the point where I would need stitches and that would take me out of the hell I'm in because I couldn't play. I was running and trying to hide from the, my fears. I came this close to doing that and I really have great compassion for people that are close to suicide and in the depressed state. I've been there. And, but I decided not to do that Ironically, because the next day, I had an appearance at the Illinois Masonic Hospital. They wanted me to come over there and sign autographs for the kids that were dying of cancer and leukemia. And to go over there and to see these kids that only had months to live with dark circles under their eyes and to see the smile come to their face when I just signed a simple autograph was heartwarming. And then they took me down into the basement at the Illinois Masonic Hospital, and out from behind the curtain comes all these kids that are in wheelchairs that will never walk again the rest of their lives. And they plopped me in a wheelchair, buckled me in, and had me play wheelchair basketball with these kids. And I'm telling you, they kicked my butt. They were doing wheelies, they were great. But after it was over, and the game was over, I remember unbuckling and jumping right up. And I got God smacked. It was like any one of these kids you saw today would love to be in your shoes. Whatever kind of slump you got going is nothing compared to what you just witnessed wake up and that was the message it became very clear to me that day and I went to the park that night didn't change my stance like I was changing it every day trying something new the only thing I changed was my attitude I now had an attitude of gratitude and I encourage all of you to have an attitude of gratitude in your life. Those kids inspired me so much that day. My average went from 200 to 258. I salvaged the season and I went from four home runs to 20 home runs. And I give credit to those kids I saw that day that would have loved to have been in my shoes. A hundred years from now, kids, young, young adults, they're not gonna remember how big your car was or how how big your house was they're going to remember you by how you inspired people those kids inspired me and I want you to inspire people in your life I got traded in 79 to Texas Rangers that you saw Burt Blylevin on the film there um they, I was only there about two months, and then they traded me to the Yankees. So I got a chance to play on the famous New York Yankees with Reggie Jackson, Lou Pinella, you know, all these great, great players, Ron Guidry. And I got to tell you one of the funniest stories that ever happened. Reggie Jackson had 399 home runs. He was hitting fourth in the lineup and I was hitting fifth in the lineup behind him. Well, Yankee Stadium was packed in anticipation of him hitting his 400th home run. He bangs it out in right center field for a home run. The place erupts, it's going crazy. Guy just hit his 400th home run, which is quite a milestone. I'm the first guy to greet him at home plate. Now you just don't go, hey, nice hit, Red, boom, you know, like that. I mean, I grabbed him like this, and I'm jumping up and down, yeah, Reggie, yeah, way to go, babe. And some guy from the New York Post at this angle takes a picture, and the headlines in the New York Post, Reggie hits 400th home run and receives kiss from Soderholm at home plate. It looked like I was sticking my tongue right in his mouth. I was so hot. I really got, really, wanted to kill this guy. I mean, I just thought it was just so uncalled for. 
I'm screaming and yelling at the photographer. I'm screaming and yelling at the, at the reporter. And Reggie sees this and he calls me over and he says, come on, let's go for a walk. Puts his arm around me, we take a walk. And he says, listen, Eric. He says, I know the MO of the Yankees is it's not whether it's good publicity or bad publicity, just make sure they spell your name right. I understand that on the Yankees. We're, we're big at fighting for the headlines. But in this case, it might be best if you just shut up because you're going to give energy to this if you keep sprouting off and energy goes flows where your attention goes so if you're giving us a whole lot of attention you're feeding it if you don't give it attention it'll go away right away and the next day never heard another thing so be careful be aware that you're creating your reality. Be aware of what kind of energy you're giving to things. My career ended quite unexpectedly. Some of the older folks might remember that Harry Carey and Jimmy Pearsall were our radio announcers back in the 70s, back then. And one particular night, we have a 0-0 a, a game going at bottom of the ninth, I'm the first hitter. I get a base hit. I'm on first base. Jimmy Pearsall in the booth says, I can't believe Bob Lemons not pinch running for Soderholm because it's going to take three base hits to score him from first base. What? I didn't hear that, obviously, but when I got home, there was like 30 messages on my recorder saying, you can't believe what Pearsall said about you. So I confronted Jimmy Pearsall at the batting cage the next day. I said, come on, Jimmy, I'm not the fastest guy in the world because I've had knee surgery, obviously. But I'm not clogging up the bases. It don't take three base hits to score me from first base. You know what he says? He says, I could beat you. I said, what? You're a 50-year-old guy that's had a heart attack. How are you going to beat me? He says, how much you want to race for? I says, whatever you want. How about $100? He says, make it a thousand I was like shocked and the reporters are all around the cage going "Ooh, this is good stuff and they're writing all this stuff down I said all right you got it a thousand bucks let's go down to the warning track and let's race right now for a thousand I don't have it on me but I'll bring it tomorrow if I lose he said oh no 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 we're gonna time each other around the base pad because where you slow down on your bad left knee, you gotta slow down to make those turns around the bases and that's where I'll catch you. Really? Okay, Jimmy, all right, I'm bringing $1,000 to the park tomorrow. We are racing before the game. He says, a deal. In the paper the next day, he says, come early to the park, Pearsall gonna race solder on. I get to the park and there's a note in my locker from Bill Vack. Come see me immediately. Don't even put on your uniform. I go, oh boy, I might be in big trouble here. So I go there and there's Bill Vack sitting in his chair going like this. I said, Bill, is this about that race with Pearsall? He says, yeah. He says, you got yourself in a no-win situation. I said, well, what do you mean? I could beat him. He says, if you beat him, they're going to say you beat a 50-year-old guy that's had a heart attack. If he happens to beat you, which I doubt, but if he happens to beat you, don't you realize he's on the mic every game. He will run your ass out of town. And I said, oh. And then he said, and the reason I'm putting an end to this, what if you pull a muscle? Now I'm screwed. Now you're on the DL. I'm calling this off. I said, okay. And I figured, well, that was a quick thousand I could have made. Race got called off, but we had that angst, energy, tension between us that you could, it was palpable. You could feel it. Now I want you to fast forward four years. I'm on the Yankees. We got beaten in the playoffs by Kansas City the year before we had the best team. We were going to the World Series the next year for sure. I get a phone call two weeks before spring training and I'm in top physical shape. I worked out all winter. Learned from, my, learned from my mistake before, hit balls. I was ready to go because I knew we were going to go to the World Series. I get a phone call, and they say, hey, uh, we're raising money 
for cripple kids down at Chicago Stadium. Playing a little charity soccer game, just a fun kick it around kind of thing. Can you come down and play? I go, yeah, I'll, I'll do that for you. I'm kind of a sucker for charity, golf events, and they're raising money for charities and stuff. So I go down there. Guess who is on the opposing team and is the goaltender? Jimmy Pearsall. And I'm going, ha, 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 ha. I'm just conniving, boy. I'm going, please, please, somebody kick me the ball so that I can be from here to the cameraman and I'm going to drill his rear end so bad. God answered the prayer. Here comes the ball right in front. And I'm like, yes. And I run up to that ball and I go to kick it and I head looked up because I wanted to look at his face, which was like this. I go to kick the ball, my leg rolls up the ball, I come down funny, I pop my anterior cruciate ligament and my medial collateral ligament, and my career is over. The Buddhists have a very interesting saying. If you're going to hang on to the energy of revenge, you might as well build two graves, one for them and one for you. I live that, folks. I know that saying. You can't be hanging on to energy, negative energy towards anyone because it's just a reflection of your insecurities and your doubts in your life. So my career is over. What do I do now? I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't prepare. I didn't study anything else other than just played baseball. What do I do now? Well, I had a long talk with myself. So, all right, well, I know how to do one thing, and that's hit a baseball. I'm going to open up some baseball camps. I got uh, 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 so uh, so associated with uh, Darien Park District, and I started doing baseball camps and giving private hitting lessons and, and started a business. Knew nothing about the business world, but became very successful. But I got tired of like hitting the button and saying the same thing over and over and over. Sometimes you'd get a real good player that came in and stuff and it kind of got you excited and stuff. But most of them were average and their dad thought they were going to make the big leagues, but they probably weren't. You know, I mean, it's a small percentage, let's be honest. And uh, so I, I, just, uh, I, I just did the hitting school and baseball camps. And then I got a phone call from somebody that said, hey, you know, Michael Jackson is playing at Kaminsky Park. Call down there. You'll be the next player and let's get some tickets. I called down there in the public relations department. I knew a guy named Danny Cohen. He says, well, I, I don't, uh, uh, I don't, we're not handling the tickets, but I do know a ticket broker uh, named Don Patano, and he's got a company called Upfront Tickets, and I know he's a big fan of yours. I've heard him talk about you. Call him, and I bet he can get you tickets. I call him, and Dan was, uh, Don was just ecstatic that I was calling. He says, yeah, oh, Eric, come on, Don, I'd love to meet you personally. I got two tickets in the front row for Michael Jackson. I got two in the seventh row for you, and I'll give them to you at my cost. I go down there. Tickets are everywhere. Money's all over the place. People in line. I'm going, man, can anybody get in this business? And he said, well, it's kind of tight-knit in the Jewish community, but, I, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll help. I'll help you. A big fan, I'll help you. So I made up a business card and just said Bob Eucher had a commercial on TV where they kicked him out. Uh, of seats and he says oh I must be in the front row and he ended up in the balcony I, that was a long time ago I know you won't remember that but I started with a business card not knowing if anybody was going to call front row tickets looks like the front row is actually is the actual name of it passing out business cards not knowing if anybody was going to call 10 years later it's a multi-million dollar company I just fell into it and went with it. And then I took the money from that. I sold it a few years back. It ended up running 30 years, and the company called StubHub came into, into existence, and it made everybody a ticket broker. So I, uh, now I'm, I'm like, nobody's calling anymore. The phones are dying, and nobody's calling because everybody's a ticket broker now. I just sell them on StubHub. So I sold the phone number and sold the company and got out of the business, but took the money that I had left and, and uh, put it into... Uh, a wellness center called Solder World. You'll see it on Route 83, south of the Stevenson Expressway. It's a big A-frame log cabin building. 
And it all started because my daughter called me. She was going to school out in San Diego, San Diego School for the Healing Arts. She calls me and says, Dad, I'm working for Deepak Chopra. I said, who's that? And, and she said, well, you'll, you'll, he's on Channel 11 a lot, and he's written many books and stuff. He's got this beautiful healing arts center. He said, and she said, someday we should do what he's doing in the Midwest. And I said, well, okay, I mean, we can certainly consider it. The next day, talk about synchronicity, the next day Deepak Chopra's on Channel 11 selling his books and his tapes and doing his talks, and I'm looking at him, he's got this Indian accent. I couldn't quite understand what he was saying, but it, it resonated with me. What he was saying, there was something about what he was saying that really interests me. So I started reading his books, and then I got into... Wayne Dyer and Caroline Mace and Marianne Williamson and just all these people that taught me through books how I could really change my life into something special. I could expand consciousness. I really believe, folks, and I, please don't take any offense to this, I honor all world religions at our place, but I really believe that this isn't about which religion is right, which religion is wrong. I think it's about expansion of consciousness. You evolve your consciousness. You don't know 12th grade algebra when you're in the first grade. But eventually through life experiences, you will come to know 12th grade algebra. To me, 12th grade algebra is the piece that Jesus talked about that surpasses all human understanding. That's our goal. So in your life, you want to look for that peace and everything becomes centered. And if you can work from that space there, you can create whatever you want in your life. So I'm gonna close by just simply saying this. I didn't make the Hall of Fame. Some people might even think he might have made the Hall of Shame. But I can make the Hall of Fame as a human being and a humanitarian. I encourage all of you to make the Hall of Fame as a humanitarian. I wish you all luck. You need a little bit of that along the way, but don't get discouraged if you get kicked down a little bit. Just live within your means and do what you love doing. I'm 70 years old now, and I'm going, wow, where did the time go? It goes by so fast, folks. You won't believe it when you get older. You can't believe how fast life goes by. And it's an e-ride at Disney World. Enjoy the ride and be the best that you can be. God bless you. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below. Click the subscribe button for new videos every week and download and review us on iTunes.